Okay. Well, thank you very much, Caleb. Uh, we certainly appreciate the opportunity to share a few thoughts on communication this, today. To communicate effectively, you need to understand the process and skills that make up human communication. The basic skills required include questioning, listening, explaining, and reflecting. In addition to the verbal aspect, nonverbal communication is also vitally important. Facial expression, posture, orientation, and voice tone all add richness to the message. Under questioning, uh, this, this is the approach we use to get information from others. But different kinds of questions yield different results. For example, closed questions elicit yes or no answers whereas open questions elicit longer responses and seek input or information from the other person. As personal questions have a special role in that these can create a sense of camaraderie between the individuals when they are sincere. Moving then to listening, uh, active listening seeks to hear what the other person is saying and understand what they are feeling. The understanding of where another person is coming from, what his or her wants are and needs are, is called empathy. Empathy is a state of harmony that exists between two people. It is a positive state that encourages better communication and better outcomes. Explaining is where some of the conversations require a lot more time the effort and involvement uh, than with other kinds of conversation. It's a person may want to have a conversation that requires a significant amount of time or effort from the other person. It'll probably go better if that person understands what he or she is getting into and consents to participate. And then finally, reflecting uh, is the key skill of a master listener. In a reflective response, the listener restates the feelings and or content of what the speaker has communicated and does so in a way that demonstrates understanding and acceptance. Now, barriers to good communication can be split into two main groups, physical and emotional. Now, physical barriers are easily recognized by observing the other person. Where they have challenges in communicating, we usually can identify those and adjust our approach accordingly. Emotional barriers, however, are not so easily recognized. The other person may have the perception that we are communicating something completely different than what the words are intended to convey. The listener may hear something different based on their own prejudging of what we mean or due to some kind of prejudice. The other person may have a profound fear or even feel threatened by what they understand we are trying to communicate which may be entirely different than what we intend. For these and a host of other reasons, the message that we are sending may not be the message that is received on the other side. When this is the case, open questioning may be needed to verify if the message has been correctly received. This approach can help break down the barriers to communication. Now, all families and families in business experience interpersonal conflicts. It's not a matter of if, but rather a matter of when. There are some basic approaches you might want to try to use in resolving conflicts when they come up. The first of those is working it out. You might encourage the individuals to work out the conflict for themselves and reward them where they are able to solve their own problems. Encourage family members to address the problem, though, and not the person. If that doesn't seem to work, then mediation might be the next step uh, that we would come to, where we follow a process where the parties involved meet with an objective third party who recommends a solution. The important thing to remember about mediation is that it is not binding. The mediator suggests a solution but it is completely up to the individuals involved to implement it. This is a half step between solving your, yourself and the next level, which is arbitration. Now, under arbitration, uh, that creates a binding solution for the folks involved 
that is imposed by someone else. In a family team setting, the arbitration could be facilitated by any other team or family member as long as all the parties agree that they will live by whatever solution the arbitrator will impose. And then finally, when all other attempts to resolve the conflict seem to have failed and as a last resort, one or more family members may need to agree not to work together in the business. Now, if this happens, it is important to maintain respect for each individual as family members, as family relationships clearly do not simply go away where people are unable to resolve their differences. In resolving conflict, uh, which is a natural part of life brought on by our differences in beliefs or experiences and values, uh, if we don't manage them carefully, uh, these kinds of conflicts can certainly harm relationships. So let's quickly run through seven steps that adults can use to resolve conflicts. The first of which is to treat other, the other persons involved with respect, and certainly that can be challenging. But any sort of disrespect that may be happening will only serve to build up even bigger barriers to any kind of a resolution. Addressing the problem directly is best done at a mutually agreed upon time and place. That likely does not mean in the heat of the moment. Working to first define what the point of conflict is can go a long way toward understanding the situation. We need to remember to use I statements here rather than you. And it's best to focus on the actions or behaviors and not the people or our perceptions of what it is they are doing. Where the two parties are sincere in resolving the conflict, they should carefully consider how they communicate their understanding with the other person. Ideally, they will seek first to understand the other person's perspective before trying to express their own position. Now, once there's a good understanding of all sides of the conflict, everyone involved should contribute to exploring the possible solutions that seem reasonable. And after discussing those alternatives, the next step is agreeing to try an approach that appears to be the most workable solution. Now, the ideal solution is one that everybody agrees is going to be a win-win for those people that are involved. Now, the best resolution to a conflict will have those involved checking back after some time has passed to verify that the approach adopted is actually working for them. If not, Adjusting that approach or that solution can certainly help avoid other conflicts from developing. Now, this is something we don't hear much about today, but clearly is much needed. Forgiveness it dares you to imagine a future based on the possibility that your hurt will not be the final word on the matter. It challenges you to give up your destructive thoughts and to believe in the possibility of a better future. It comes from the confidence that you can survive the pain of a conflict and grow from it. Now to start off, identify the situation to be forgiven and ask yourself, am I going to waste my energy even further on this particular issue? If not, then that's it. It does not mean you will forget what happened or that the person is not responsible for what he or she did or that you need to bring him or her back into your life. If you tell somebody else about it, well, that's a bonus. However, keep in mind that forgiveness does not require that you speak to any other person to begin your own healing process. It has little or nothing to do with another person because forgiveness is an internal matter. To forgive another person simply means that you will no longer allow another person's actions or words to cause you resentment, anger, or pain. Now, the greatest misperception about forgiveness is the belief that forgiving the offense means that somehow you condone it. That is not true. In fact, we can only forgive what we know to be wrong. Forgiveness does not mean that you have to reconcile with someone who treated you badly. 
Forgiveness is the experience of finding peace inside yourself and can neither be compelled or stopped by another person. Forgiveness is a creative act that changes us from being prisoners of the past to be liberated people at peace with our memories. It is not forgetfulness, but it involves accepting the promise that the future can be more than dwelling on memories of past injuries. Now, clearly, these communication skills are essential for managing intergenerational issues throughout the legacy process. Communication breakdowns are the single most influential barrier to successfully completing the transition to the next generation. Now, the founders of the farm or ranch need to know and understand that the family members have expectations as they relate to the current and future management and ownership of the family farm. People are and will be planning their lives, and they need information to make informed decisions. Lack of effective communication among family members is the root cause of most family business failures. Family council meetings, family business meetings, and family business rules and policies provide communication channels through which the family component can be managed. There can be benefits to using an outside family business expert to facilitate family business meetings, or at least to get them started. Engaging the services of an expert who works with family businesses, who understands the significance of family dynamics, and is willing to deal with family issues could be one of the best investments you make. The family council meeting is intended to provide a forum to keep the broader family informed of what is going on in the family business, as well as to keep the current and anticipated roles of the family in it. These meetings are typically comprised of the broader family, including spouses, potentially in-laws, children, could be grandparents and even grandchildren, uh, whether they're active or non-active in the family business. So unlike family council meetings, family business meetings are comprised only of family members who are active in the business. Family business meetings are not intended to replace the regular business or management meetings. Instead, these are meetings for family members who are working together in the business and that are dedicated to dealing with the interaction between the family and the business. The agenda of the meeting can be primarily business issues, could be primarily family issues, or could be a combination of both. But the meetings are intended to help family members who are working in the business deal with those interactions between the family and the business. And then finally, establishing family business rules and policies could result in one of the most important pieces of work achieved by the family business in effectively managing this family component. Family business rules and policies are intended to provide a set of guidelines to help family members in their personal business and family relationships. There are several points we might want to consider here. I'll just touch on a few of those. And start off with the history of the family farm. A really good starting point oftentimes is to write out the family business history so that everybody who is involved is aware of just how the family and the business have gotten to where they are today. Another point might be the family business and council meetings within which a framework is uh, is certainly a good way to develop leadership among family members. And to do that, we provide them uh, with an opportunity to, to provide leadership for these meetings by rotating the responsibility for planning and executing those family meetings among different family members. Another area within this uh, set of guidelines might be compensation for family members. What is it that the family business policy, uh, what is the family business policy with respect to compensation for family members? A full discussion on how to develop a compensation strategy Uh, as outlined in some of the other materials we've posted online, uh, but clearly having that spelled out could really help dispel a lot of misunderstanding. Ownership by future generations in terms of the business or the family operation 
what are the current thoughts with respect to the future ownership of the farm? Who can own it? How is it that ownership will be determined? And when will it occur? How is it going to be funded? Another really important aspect would be an exit strategy. Are there rules and policies that have been put in place or thoughts been uh, articulated that include an ex exit strategy for family members what, in order to allow them to leave the ownership ranks of the farm? If so, how is that to be handled? What will be the details or the strategy that they should follow? And there are certainly many other issues or items that could be addressed within these rules and policies uh, that would be maybe unique to the particular family or the business situation. And those uh, should be included as it may seem that appropriate to do so. Now, successful family businesses are based on strong teamwork among active family members. The strong teamwork leads to greater productivity and creativity, an increased family self-esteem, and ultimately to success for the family, the business, and even for yourself. Now, every team member will ideally be committed, and that is all family members must be committed to the mission and goals of the business and to each other. That's going to allow all active family members to participate in the decision-making process and that, as a good way to ensure that commitment is sustained. They also are going to cooperate. Cooperation is based on a shared sense of purpose and mutual gain. For full cooperation, the team must be willing to reward that co cooperation. The founders or the managers must be willing to link pay increases and recognition for team performance and productivity. And finally, every team member needs to contribute. Uh, contribution should never be an option. All family members must contribute toward the mission and goals of the family business. Uh, the founders or the managers cannot afford to sacrifice the good of the family team for the good of just one individual. I guess I'd just close here with uh, restating that a legacy is something that's handed down from one period of time to another. An individual's legacy is the summation of a lifetime of achievement and the context in which that lifetime will be remembered. It's important to remember that each of us will leave behind a legacy, whether we want to or not. The question is, is your legacy ready? So again, thank you, Caleb, for the opportunity. I guess I'd be happy now to try to answer any questions that may have come in as we've been making the presentation.